evaluate the definite integrals. So my first one, we're going to integrate from 1 to e over natural log of x dx. You note know, here, we only have one function. So the way I get around that to use integration by parts is to let the other function be equal to 1. If I let u be equal to 1, du goes to 0. And that's not very helpful. So we'll let dv be equal to 1 dx, and I'll let u be equal to natural log of x. du is then 1 over x dx, and then v is just going to be equal to x. Integration by parts rule says multiply along the diagonal, subtract the integral as you go up. So that's going to mean x natural log x minus integral of x times 1 over x dx, but that collapses to a 1. Any derivative of 1 is just x. So now I just need to put my limits in and then take their difference. We stick e in for the first one. I get e natural log of e minus e. Well, natural log of e is just 1, so we want it with e minus e gets 0. We put 1 in. I'm going to have 1 times natural log of 1 minus 1. Natural log of 1 is 0, so I'm going to have minus a minus 1. If you didn't use your parentheses, you're going to get into trouble here because that minus sign won't reach this minus 1 over here. But since it does, we're going to wind up with our answer of 1. And note, if you want an interpretation of this, this is going to be the area under the curve natural log of x between 1 and e. So we would expect a positive number. So if you, mess, if you drop the minus sign, you'll get a negative number, and you know that that can't be right. Try another one. Let's go from 0 to 1 fourth of sine inverse 2x dx. So here, same idea. I only have one function. So I'm going to have to let my other function be equal to 1. And we don't want to let it be u, because then du is equal to 0. So we'll have dv equals 1 dx. u equals sine inverse of 2x. OK, we can take the antiderivative of 1, gives me x. And then taking the derivative of u is going to be what we get when we follow out for our inverse trig. So remember, derivative of, pretend there's a box here, sine inverse of box is just going to be 1 over radical 1 minus box squared. And then on the top, we put the derivative of box. So box is just going to have a 2x in it. So we're just going to put a 2x in the box in the bottom. The derivative of 2x is just 2. So we put that up top. OK, cleaning it up, we'll get 2x, 2dx over radical 1 minus 4x squared. Multiply along the diagonal, and then integrate the product going up. That's going to give me x sine inverse of 2x. We subtract off the integral going up. Integral going up is going to be 2x over radical 1 minus 4x squared dx. And we note what's on the inside here, its derivative is just close to what's up on top. So we're going to substitute, and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to let y be equal to 1 minus 4x squared. dy is going to be equal to minus 8x dx. And then dx equals minus 1 minus minus dy over 8x. We can substitute these in. So I'll have dx goes to dy over minus 8x. The 2x is up on top. We have radical y on the bottom. So the x's are going to go away. We'll have a 1 fourth with a minus sign, which gets rid of the minus sign in front. And then I'm left with y to the 1 minus 1 half dy. Any derivative of this we can do, that's just add 1, flip it over. So that's going to turn into 2y to the 1 half. And now I can just substitute back, and then we can start putting actual numbers in since we have a definite integral. So that'll turn into x sine inverse 2x plus 1 half radical 1 minus 4x squared from 0 to 1 fourth. Now remember, we have to be careful with zeros. Okay, if you have a polynomial, it's no constant term. Zero in gives you zero out. But a lot of times, you got to make sure you check these things. So what's going to happen here? Let's go with the zero first, because that's simpler. Well, I put zero into this. It doesn't matter what sine inverse of zero is, because I have a zero out in front. Okay, as long as sine inverse of zero is defined, we're OK, and it is, because 
sine of zero equals zero, so sine inverse of zero is also zero. You just switch the position of two zeros, which does nothing. Okay, the language trick. So we're going to get a zero for this term. I put a zero in here, then I'm just looking at square root of one, and that's just going to leave me with a half. Make sure you use your parentheses, or you'll miss the minus sign. Okay, the tough part is with the one quarter. So we'll have one quarter inverse sine of a half, because we have two over four. So we'll keep track of that for now. And then when I put my quarter into here, that's going to turn to 1 16th. But we have a four there, so that'll be 1 fourth, or 1 minus a fourth is 3 fourths. And that's inside the radical. Next, we want to get rid of the sine inverse of half get an actual number for that. So what's the rule for this? Well, first, I give this thing the name theta. So theta equals sine inverse of a half, which is the same as saying that sine of theta equals a half. Now remember, sine is the y value on the unit circle. So that's going to have to hit the unit circle in this horizontal line here at y equals a half. Okay, next, we also know that sine inverse only gives us values between minus pi halves and pi halves. So I'll blacken that in so that it's pretty clear we're only looking at this point here. And then we know for a half, well, the half and square root of 3 over 2 always go with multiples of pi sixths or pi thirds. So we just have to decide is it pi sixths or pi thirds since we're in the first quadrant. We'll note that 1 half, okay, compared to the square root of 3 over 2, which is roughly 0.87, a half is smaller, which means we're looking for the angle with the smaller y value. So that means we're going to have to go with pi sixth for the inverse sine of 1 half. So I'll put that in, and then I'm left with pi sixth times a quarter plus a half radical 3 over 2 minus a half. Okay, and that's our answer.